Um, so I'll just introduce our two panellists that we have and then I'll do Rupert if and when she comes. Um, so Maniza Shamsi is the author of a literary history, Hybrid Tapestries, The Development of Pakistani Literature in English. She has edited three anthologies of Pakistani English literature, including And the World Change, Contemporary Stories by Pakistani Women, for which the Feminist Press of New York received two awards in the United States. She is bibliographic representative of Pakistan for the Journal of Commonwealth Literature. Actually, I'm editor-in-chief of that, so um, I know Manisa rather well, which is wonderful. She also serves on our editorial board um, and on that of the Journal of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies, the International Advisory Board for the Journal of Postcolonial Writing, and is on the Advisory Committee for Bengali Lights and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. She was on the jury of the 2013 DSC Prize and Regional Chairperson Eurasia of the Commonwealth Writers Prize from 2009 to 2011. She lives in Karachi and con contributes to Dawn, Newsline and Newsweek Pakistan. And then Osama Sadiq has practiced law on Wall Street, taught at Harvard Law as the inaugural Henry J. Steiner Visiting Professor in Human Rights, authored a multiple award-winning critical history of South Asian legal systems published by Cambridge, and teaches policy reform in many parts of the world as secret senior faculty for a Harvard-based research center. A Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, he is also a Government College, Lahore, and LUMS Business School alumnus. With a doctorate in law from Harvard, he works as an independent scholar, writer, teacher, and expert advisor on justice sector reform. A fascination for ancient ruins, the human civilization project, the fantastical and the picturesque, and the multifariousness of history inspired him to write his staggering debut novel, Snuffing Out the Moon, published by Penguin Random House, India. It spanned 4,000 years of South Asian history, and in this it actually really reminds me of Kuratal and Haider's River of Fire, Al Qadariya, you know, really, really ambitious, particularly for a first novel, a real fantastic read. Um, so it goes from 2084 BC right up to 2084 AD, so past, present, and future, telling multiple connected stories with common themes set in six different eras. So it's a real pleasure to have both these um, colleagues um, and wonderful writers on the panel. But our brief today is particularly about Lahore, um, of which Osama has a strong connection and Maniza is more associated with Karachi but really knows the literary work of Lahore better than anyone. I mean, Maniza is just so compendious in her reading. So I want to start by asking you both what your connection with Lahore is like. Well, my connection with Lahore is that I was born here. Um, and uh, my father was posted here. And um, then I left when I was very little. And then we um, came back for about a, a few months. And I've lived in Karachi most of my life. Of course, we had very dear, my father loved Lahore. He had very good friends here. Those friends were always coming and going. So we were very aware of Lahore in our family. Of course, I have relatives here. And um, actually, when I'm talking about connection with Lahore, one of the things we're talking about literature, one of my great memories of Lahore is when I was in my teens, and we used to come here, this in the 60s, and um, in the 60s, it's the horses, that amazing horse show. And I, 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 I realized when I was, um, reading or checking up, that actually the, the horse show, the, the horse culture that I remember so well, the, the horse races, the polo. I came here one year and there was, a, there was this fabulous horseshoe with this, I remember the tattoo and the, and the uh, polo, polo team, there was the Argentinian polo team. I mean, these were my great sort of early images of Lahore. And of course, I've been coming here for the literature festival and um, really my connection with Lahore as, is a, a sort of at an angle. It's as a, as a visitor and someone who has um, many 
uh, friends and who I think it's such a beautiful city. Yeah, I, I also, I'm even less, I have even less of a connection though. I do know the city and because I spent a year in Peshawar when I was in the 90s when I was very young, but the family I lived with was Punjabi, so we came across quite regularly for weddings, but mine is the most tangential. Oh, hello, Rupa's um, here. Rupa's hello. here. Welcome. So that's fabulous. And let me just introduce her and then Asana, we want to sure. hear from you about your connection with Lahore and then we'll hear from Rupa about her connection. So Rupa Faruqi, who we're so delighted got here, is the author of six critically acclaimed novels, The Good Children, The Flying Man, Half-Life, The Way Things Look to Me, Corner Shop and Bittersweet, published with Headline and Macmillan. She's been shortlisted for the Orange, Prime, Orange Award for New Writers and the Muslim Writers Awards, and has also been long-listed for the Women's Prize twice, the DSC South Asian Literature Prize, and the Impact Dublin Literary Award. Her books have been published internationally in 13 countries across Europe and in the US. She was awarded the John C. Lawrence Prize oh, sorry. Um, from the Authors' Foundation for writing which improves understanding between races and an Art Council Literature Award. She lectures on the Creating Writing Masters at the University of Oxford and is studying medicine at St. George's University of London. Following her 2016 shortlisting for the Commonwealth Word Write, Common Word Prize for Children's Fiction, Rupert is currently working on diverse fiction for young people. I mean, I just don't know how you've done it all, <laughs> particularly as she also has four children. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Um, Osama, what's your connection with Lahore? Thanks, Claire. Um, I guess uh, where we were born is purely happenstance, and I was born here as well. But what's truly fortunate is if you start uh, developing a relationship with the place you live in and, and how that relationship becomes more and more profound with the passage of time. So I guess now looking back, there are so many associations with the war. Um, you know, a very happy childhood, the fact that my parents actually going back further, who were both students at Dublin College Law, where I spent a very formative part of my life and first got introduced really to Pakistani literature being written in English, but also got further introduced to the glorious literary tradition which this city has. Um, that's where they met, and, and that's where I eventually went. And this is a city which I've sort of progressively excavated and gotten to know and become familiar with. And I find it truly unique. I'm sure a lot of people, wherever they live in the world, say the same. And that is quite true, I'm sure. But I think the world is one of those cities which is relatively ill understood or not quite as prominent in the sort of global gaze as some of the other great cities of the world. And, and I think it's truly a shame, but I think that that's slowly changing. Um, but yes, I, I have many years of association with the city. And, um, there is something about its architecture, there's something about its layout, and there's something about the hospitality of its people, which despite the fact that I've had the opportunity to live in various parts of the world, is truly appealing, which is the reason that this is where I live. Rupa. Well, first of all, apology. I apologise unreservedly for my tardiness. The, um, the person who's collected me wasn't able to get into my accommodation, so I'm really, really sorry about that. And the question was about our connection, connection. with Lahore. I was actually born in Lahore, so um, that's actually a huge connection. And although I left when I was very young, my, um, my sisters, they started off their education here. And um, when we went back, when we went to the UK, um, a lot of my memories and my conversations with my parents were about Lahore and the place that we grew up and the place that kind of formed them. A lot of my formative memories and conversations with my parents as, second gener as first generation immigrants to the UK and then for myself as a second generation was informed by, I guess, a sense of belonging here. And it was quite strange to sort of belong in two places at once, which I think kind of goes into my fiction where you get a sense of you are neither here nor there. You are never, you always have a slight sense of being an imposter wherever you are. You know, never truly quite British, never truly quite Pakistani, even though it's a place you were born. And I guess for me, the way I tried to make sense of that, of this place that I visited every year, but I couldn't quite speak the language, a place that um, I had a complicated relationship with because of my mother was from Bangladesh and she had some quite bad memories of Pakistan from the 70s. With all these things, I guess I tried to make sense of it in my fiction. So I guess I tried to revisit and re 
kind of re-embroider my world, reweave my world between Britain and Pakistan and create something in fiction that meant something, I guess, personal to me. So I guess the Lahore that I write about isn't everyone's Lahore. It is my kind of, just as my London isn't everyone's London, it's my kind of personal tapestry, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I saw people getting books up. In my book, I've got a chapter on Lahore, so mine is an, more of an academic interest. And this idea that Lahoris say Lahore, Lahore, hey, um, to emphasize the distinctiveness of the city really interests me. And then there was a typo in Anatole Levin's book, Pakistan, a Hard Country. He writes, Pakistan is the heart, stomach, and backbone of Pakistan. And what he means is Lahore, but he puts Pakistan as the backbone of Pakistan. And he says, in, in, indeed, in the view of many inhabitants, it is Pakistan. Um, so I just wonder if you could comment on how distinctive do you think the city is? And is it true to see, as many commentators do, the city as a microcosm of Pakistan as a whole? Manisa. Well... <clears throat> No, obviously not, because one comes from Karachi, and so one can't see one city as a microcosm as a whole. Um, in fact, you, you will, uh, you know, why um, you actually pose this so Karachi while you start off the huge Karachi Lahore debate, which I'm not <laughs> going to get into. You know, you, it's so pathetic if it comes to is the LLF better or is the KLF better, you know, this kind of thing. And we really don't want to go. And for, in any case, I think this is. We, we, I don't know why we deny diversity in Pakistan. We're such a rich country. We have so much diversity. But of course, Lahore is a very special city. It is a beautiful city. It has got, it's um, rich in history. It's full of dynamic people. Um, I think that you can't deny. And, um, and, and I, I, I love, the other thing I must say I love about Lahore is the pride in the city. You, you actually you don't have those kind of ethnic divides where everybody's sort of um, quarreling with each other, which is, which in, in a way enriches Karachi and also confuses it. And the kind of pride that has taken in, in the preservation of monuments. We were walking through um, the old city and I remember um, a friend, she said, you can see the love with which this has been restored, the, the kind of care that has been restored. And, but yes, in a way, um, so I, I wouldn't agree that it's the embodiment of Pakistan, but in a way, it is a very important and a, a kind of, um, well, I don't know, it's not, not the word is not pulse, but, but, but it is the one, one of the most important and vibrant cities in the, in, in the country, and I, and I think it's a wonderful city. So I completely concur. I think uh, it's, it's often misleading. I think the world that we live in, which is a world which has a tendency towards homogenization, a tendency towards centralizing things, all the more important to resist that temptation. I think Lahore is a very important, very glowing piece of the overall mosaic, which is Pakistan and indeed this entire region. But can't we think of it? I mean, before the 9th century, we don't know that much about its history, so it still remains to be excavated. I mean, we really start learning about Lahore from the time of Mahmud of Ghazni onwards. Uh, we know that there was a Hindu uh, presence here in the city here, but there's not a lot known. If you talk about older cities, Multan to the south is actually an older city. If you talk about other cities with a mixed architecture, Peshawar has that. Um, so despite the fact that Lahore overlaps in a lot of ways with other cities, uh, I think it's quite remarkable that you are just three hours away from one of the main sites of the Indus Valley Civilization. You're just five and a half hours away from one of the main sites of the Gandharan Civilization. Um, it has pre-mobile, mobile, mobile post-mobile, you know, colonial architecture. It is indeed the city of universities and gardens, as it has always been known. Uh, it, you know, so I think it's a truly remarkable city, but Pakistan is a truly remarkable place. And there's so many other places, and I find myself so ignorant, even living in this country, having not seen so many parts. And every time I discover something, uh, including my recent trip to Karachi, I realize how little I know the city. So I think one takes pride in the fact that this is a special city, but it's one of many in this country. Um, yeah, I concur with what everyone said about diversity. Obviously, we celebrate the differences in our cities and in our countries as 
you know, as we should, but also I guess we celebrate what we share. So in some ways I do actually quite agree with what your suggestion and what's been dis discussed about the idea of the microcosm, simply because it is a very personal experience how one takes on a city and thereby a country. And I guess for me, because it was the part of Pakistan I knew when I was growing up and which my parents talked to me about, and which had, you know, how are you knotted into your world? You're knotted into it by your relationships. And so my relationships with my grandmother, with my aunts and my uncles, they all happened in this city. They all happened in a certain number of streets around Gulberg, to be honest, so in quite a very small part of this city. And so that was the, um, the gateway, I guess, for me to understand something about Pakistan. So it would be impossible for me to understand the whole of this vast country. But I understood a little bit about that small part of my world. So I guess that was the only way I could understand Pakistan was by understanding this small part of it. One of the things we were asked to think about on this panel in the subtitle was um, about capturing Lahore's stories. In relation to Lahore's literary heritage, we might think about things like the Pak Tea House, um, the Progressive Writers Association, and more recently the fictions of Bapsi Sidwa, Mohsin Hamid, Nadeem Aslam, and people like Rupert and Osama as well. And so I just wondered, um, Maniza, to start with, how are such writers creating a city of the imagination as well as of bricks and mortar? Well, the, uh, the city of the imagination, the city, actually there's a, um, you, you, to, uh, you really need to go back to the first novel that was ever written by a Pakistani, it means after post-1947, and that, of course, is The Heart Divided by um, uh, Mumta Shanawaz, and she, the fact that she died in 1948, though the book wasn't published till uh, 1957, I think, means that her novel, I mean, it's absolutely unique, because I don't think there, at least in English, there is no other novel uh, that Indian or Pakistani, which gives such an immediate picture of the events that led to partition. Uh, she stops at 1940, so you don't have the partition riots. But the, the ferment of ideas, the, uh, the, again, the diversity, and so she creates a, a, a very uh, different Lahore, different Pakistan, and the ideas that went into the whole Pakistan um, movement and the Pakistan resolution and the, and the different, um, you know, you had the social, it wasn't just Hindu Muslim, it wasn't just Congress Muslim League, that you had the Khaksas, you had the communists, you had the socialists and all these, um, and of course you had the British and how all these developed into and led up to the Pakistan movement. And I, th so you have in literature a kind of, um, also, Pakistan in the imagination. You know, in Pakistan English literature, it's not just Pakistan as it became, but Pakistan how it was perceived. And uh, uh, for that reason, although she died before editing it, so that there are all those problems. And then, of course, in um, in other uh, in other books like um, Mohsin's and. Um, Nadim, they, they create the narrative of, of Lahore, of how, and it is also, you also get, you constantly get references to history, to the buildings, to the, to the Mughal architecture, and um, the Mohsin's uh, moth smoke is framed by an incident in Mughal history, and that itself becomes metaphorical. Tariq Ali writes about um, what he himself was involved in, partly the uh, strong, strong left-wing movement of the 1960s. And then his uh, Night of the Golden Butterfly, it then moves on to the, later to the Zia regime and how, how the city changes and it's, uh, how it is overtaken by military rather than the um, civilian um, processes. Um, there's one aspect of Lahore that is hardly ever discussed, and it's not a book I've been able to revisit because I found it in the British Library. And that's a um, novel by a man called Julian Samuel. He's a Canadian Pakistani, where he's best known as an artist. What is unique about his book is that he is a Christian and he is um, gay. And he, 
uses this in uh, both in uh, Canada and in Pakistan of what it means to belong and yet be different. And the other important part of his uh, narrative as a Christian is he describes the Christian community. He, he says, you know, it changes after 1958. He describes what a rich, um, multicultural, um, tolerant kind of multi-faith society it was, and then gradually changes take place. He leaves in 1958. And his description of the Christian community, and the other thing is, of course, that one of the troubles with Pakistani English fiction when they describe the Christian community, they're usually people who come from very rigid backgrounds and have struggled their way up. He is showing a different aspect of the Christian community which exists and which is not sufficiently portrayed in our fiction. And that is, you know, people who can, I mean, his father used to wear a, a turban because they were of Christ, um, Sikh origin and he paid, played tribute to that heritage always, although they were Christian, they were involved with the Christian community. And um, so that is one aspect of Lahore that I would like to see, of Pakistan actually, that I would like to see much more of, and which is why I think this book is so important, although it's sort of, it's got defects as a work of fiction, but as, you know, it peters out, but it, it is something that we should look at. So, it's quite remarkable that despite the fact that one has lived in, in this city for so many years and continues to live here, the way I imagine and conceive the city is as much a function of what I've read about it. It's amazing how you internalize it, it's amazing how that seeps through into your own process of imagining the city and writing about it. And I must confess that in my case it was, yes, Pakistani literature being written in English. And Babsi Sibba was an early influence, and mm -hmm. I think even people like Kofi Krafat, who wrote very good poetry and was uh, iconic for that generation of writers. I was equally influenced by people writing Urdu, and you know, having the privilege of being able to sort of read that beautiful language. Um, so I would mention, for instance, Banu Putsia, a very sort of prominent Urdu novelist, and she wrote a novel called Raja Ghir, and I have deep issues with the politics, but I'm deeply impressed by the aesthetics. Um, and so in her novel, The Lawrence Garden, which you must have seen on the way here, uh, prominently figures, and there is one particular tree which is meant to be uh, under the influence of a, a jinn. And it has a central role in that entire story, and not a trip to the Lawrence Garden goes by when I don't think of that story, and, and, and what it sort of evokes in me. And, um, and recently they put up a little plaque on the tree itself, or the tree which is imagined to be the tree in that story, which is a camphor tree, and it mentions a writer, which I thought was brilliant. I can't go to the Jahangir's tomb without thinking of Ashfaq Emma's early short stories, uh, uh, the romantic era, uh, in which, you know, the romantic period of his literature, because then he moved on to spirituality. Um, so I think there's a lot of that. And then when I wrote myself, so my novel uh, is, of course, a historical novel, and it has six eras, and three of them actually have no heart. And so that gave me an opportunity to actually both show the evolution of the city, but also to have this opportunity to show the same place in a different century with a different cast of characters. So a place may be a glorious palace in one era, and it may be a ruin in another you know, era. And so how does time and the vagaries of time have an influence? How do people interpret or misinterpret the same place? Um, so I almost made an attempt to crystallize my own sort of impressions of places which I've always really sort of imagined to be uh, evocative. So from the old city to Jangi's tomb, to the entire rooftop sort of life which you see in Lahore, to Miami's tomb, you know, so Lahore in many ways can also be, the topography can be imagined in terms of the prominent saints and, and, and the calling of the various people who go to these tombs because there are important differences between people who go to Madhu Lagasen's tomb or to Data Darbar's tomb, or to Mir's Mi sort of Muslim. So in any event, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable how our own conception and imagining gets very much influenced by what we have read about the place. Uh, and in that sense, Lahore has had rich tributes paid to it. But as I said, a lot more needs to be said because it's a truly enigmatic city, and there's so much more which remains uh, unexcavated. Um, to answer the question, um, this morning actually I was reviewing, I was having a look through how I'd actually expressed Lahore in my own novels 
And it was interesting how I came across, I, I found that I was doing actually a very similar thing, even though I was talking about, I have different chapters set in different places. What I was always doing was connecting it back to the people in that city. So for a character who was a child there and their experience of schooling and education and their almost comically severe mother in the 50s going study, study harder, and how he would associate that with the city. And then when he returned, he would still carry that sense of guilt that you know, and he should be grateful to be coming home. But in fact, it was a bereavement that brought him back, it was duty. So it was a similar sense of that study, study harder. This is my duty, this is what I should do. And so he had that sense, but then also it's a city where he found love. And then when he returns, he thinks, well, this is what I should remember. This is what is, what is most important, that he's remembering his, the love between his parents, the love of when he found his wife. And he goes back and says, he loved her and she loved him. And this is what matters when everything else is broken. So it's about those connections, I think, those relationships in some ways anthropomorphize this, the city. So it becomes almost like a character in itself because the character is expressed and internalized through the people and the relationships that are within that city. And I think that could be true of many places, but I think that's why when I write about Lahore particularly, those themes are always coming back to me, those of, I guess, leaving and those of returning, and what causes you to, to leave, to run away, get pushed away in some cases, and then what draws you back. Thank you. That's a great place to end, because I want to also follow on from that by asking, you've all got different sort of attachments to the city, some much more long-lasting than others, but what is the experience like for you or for other writers of returning to a city you once called home or maybe where you were born but you're now more of a stranger to you so it's sort of ideas about belonging and unbelonging and where home is really and, and how we see that in both the t two fiction writers work but also in all the the writers that you study Manisa. I'm sorry. So just about um, home, where's home, and, and writers, diasporic writers who return to Lahore, um, and got, you know that kind of um, sort of at once belonging but not belonging. Well, actually, to me, home is it's kind of it's a kind of a complicated term. Um, after this kind of bizarre story, in a way, about home, I, 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 my home is Karachi, and I, if you speak to me today, it is home. When I was nine, I was sent off to school in England, to boarding school, and I came back when I was 19. And my family comes from Lucknow, and um, we've lived, I mean, we came to Karachi in 1947. So one day I met this Indian diplomat, and you know how Indians always sort of kind of de doing these, their sort of bit of PR and trying to negate that there would be the division. So this Indian diplomat says to me, and when are you going home? I thought he meant England. Um, it never occurred to me that he thought I should be uh, home to me was Lucknow. Okay, so I was grandmothers and forebears had lived there. But home at that point of my life, when I was about 21 or 25, was England. And that was the home I had left, though actually my home technically was Karachi because I had lived there and then been sent from Karachi to England. So the idea of home is to me something, and all these years later, there is that English part of me. Um, well, again, I, I'm talking metaphorically, I'm talking about myself rather than literature, but I think this is true of all these uh, writers who have a Pakistani heritage and who live in England or who have been grown up in England, moved to Pakistan, and then they write, or you go to America. Um, now I've lost the thread of what I was saying. Um, oh, about, about home. I, I will come back to it and let, let you answer that. So I think I also lived away from Pakistan for about 12 years, but yes. I, I don't think Lahore ever left me. Um, which is not to say that I, there are not times when I don't feel out of place there, or I don't feel at home elsewhere. I mean, I think human beings are complicated uh, sort of beings, and, 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 and you can, and it's perfectly fine to develop associations which are deep with other places. Um, there are things which I deeply contest in terms of my social existence in the hall, and there are things which I deeply cherish 
Um, but I guess I wouldn't call myself a diasporic uh, author in that sense, that I'm coming back and looking at Lahore, uh, using a new lens, much as there was osmosis when I was living elsewhere, trying to imbibe whatever those cultures had to offer, much as I can feel fairly comfortable, let's say, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or in New York. Um, I guess the fact that I spend more time here, the fact that I speak the language people speak here, which is particular to this part of the world, the mannerisms, the wit, I think what I really truly like about Lahore is not only the hospitality, but also the particular Lahori sense of humor. Uh, in very, very adverse political times, you know, how they stand up to that and, you know, without sort of getting too serious about themselves. So those are things which I think have become abiding attractions as far as the city is concerned. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've never been alienated from the city uh, in any sense of the word. Uh, it's always been, been there with me. Okay, can I just go back what, uh, what I was actually thinking of? You see, because because of these uh, literary histories and things I do. When I first started for my first uh, anthology, Dragonfly and the Sun, I had uh, included a lot of diaspora writers. Until then, there was this great sort of nationalistic thing that if you had lived abroad, or if you wrote, if you, if you be qualified as a Pakistani writer, you had to write about Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And if you went away, you were disqualified. And if you, I mean, you know, uh, the poet Adrian Hussein, Poor chap, he wrote, wrote poetry that wasn't focused in Pakistan, and someone said he was, oh, they said he and Zulfiqar Ghos were deracinated. You know, this amazing statement, and what does it mean? And you take Zulfiqar Ghos, for example. He's an example of a diaspora writer. Pakistan has never left him. I mean, if you read his writings about Brazil, um, for one thing, when he goes to Rio de Janeiro, and he, part of his childhood was spent in Goa, the houses, the names, they were all so familiar. And, that, and then his response to things like colonialism, his response to martial law, I mean, there are kind of parallels with South American that have clear resonances with Pakistan. I don't think an English writer with, without any of these experiences would respond to Brazil that way. Maybe a Brazilian may or may not. So I then, that is why I started including uh, diaspora writers, because I, I think what you say you are defines your vision, it defines your perception, and it defines what you write. I think the, um, the complicated idea of home is um, something that I've probably spent much of you know, the last 10 years and my last six novels and more trying to, trying to work out trying to think about how that actually, what that actually means to me and to others. I think part of that, I mean, we write in the beginning from our own experiences, and I guess for me it was always a kind of a complicated experience because I was born in Pakistan, I was raised in London, um, I lived, I raised my children in France for 10 years, and then I, and I did my um, undergraduate study and then I went on to teach in Oxford. So these are different places and there are, you know, as I said, we kind of weave a tapestry and we weave our own. So we try and create a sense of where we are from and where we're going to. And I think that, I think that for me, I try to define it in my, um, in my second novel, Corner Shop, where I was talking about a different type of immigrant, someone who was um, from a little village in the south of France who was moving to a big city in, um, in London. And if you're French, the idea of home is something quite, you can't really translate it. It's either home is in la maison, the house, so very specifically the house. It would be, for me, 12 Canal Park, Lahore, that house, that place. Or it's some place that belongs to you, not that you belong to. You say chez moi, chez elle. It is my house, her house. So it is something that is very unique to yourself. And I think in that, in that book, the way I tried to define it then was that home, in its simplest form, is a place that you're either trying to leave or you're trying to get back to. And I think that sense of always being the other has informed a lot of my writing. And I think because I think I'm interested in people who are on the edges of something. And eventually, in my fourth novel, I worked out that it's not to do with a physical space. It's not, I had um, a character who had um, bipolar disorder who was running away from London. She was running back to her, the place where she was from, she was trying to kind of uncover the ghosts of her past. And I realized that home is not here or there, 
It's actually that place where you have peace of mind within you. It is actually a mental state. That is home. It is a place where you have peace of mind. And so eventually, I think, I worked it out that much as it is informed by your experience of physical places, it is about the place where you yourself feel safe. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I've got lots more questions, but I think it's time to open it up to you, the audience. And um, so any questions for our authors, they could be about the whole, but they don't have to be. Yeah. So my... Can you, can you share, really? <laughs> question I think is well we were given the topic first of all uh, it wasn't our choice and we had some reservations as you will have seen I think it's really important to flag up that the city is um, there throughout world literature um, and I actually think sometimes the rural gets lost in all this um, and that we need to also think I mean you know some time ago 70 years ago there was a lot of obsession with the village and guardian sort of idea but but then Rushdie's Midnight's Children came along and everything changed um, I, yeah I did want to talk more about progressive writers and, and Manto and people like that but I haven't really got the expertise so I'd like to know what the rest of you think so I mean there's no contestation with what you're saying and as I said earlier I, I grew up in the influence of all these writers and, um, but I think considering that you know literature is not a priority generally speaking in our society I mean, relatively few people read and that's something which is a joint sort of struggle. I think it's not about our party or anybody else's party. Let there be a thousand parties, right? And 50 festivals. And I think a lot of the Urdu, Punjabi and English, not all, but a lot of them actually intermingle and talk to each other. And a lot of us actually read in multiple languages. When it comes to great writers, I think you're right. I mean, there are lots of people who've written about cities, but there are people like George Orwell, who cannot be classified as a writer who you know, writes on a particular city. There are people who have written great books about their cities in their own language or they've written in English. Um, I think for far too long there has been this contestation on the basis of language ever since Pakistan was created. We still haven't sorted it out. Uh, and much as in my novel I'm sort of propagating this idea that we should have a richer, multifarious identity, I think part of that identity is to be multilingual. Let there be more literature, let there be more reading. Why should we get bogged down? But I am completely with you. I mean, there are panels and there are panels, and this one was focusing on this, but uh, there's a huge uh, tribute which needs to be paid to writers in local and national and regional languages who have produced some amazing work, which is unfortunately not available to quite a few people because it hasn't been translated. Um, well, I, I'd like to uh, say something. I think this whole issue of language is um, 
we, we, you see the, the point of this English, uh, this panel was about English language fiction. It wasn't about lore in fiction, in Pakistani fiction. It was specifically about English language fiction, which is a very new uh, fiction that has grown and developed. We, you can't take away the fact that we have inherited English as a colonial inheritance, that we have English medium schools, that, and, and you also have, of course, people now moving into the Anglophone diaspora. There are two things here. One is that it is constantly, there's a constant um, attack in Pakistan that these are the elitist schools and all this, this elitist literature by all these boring elitist people. Well, the fact is that it is not only by the boring elitist people of Pakistan, it is being written by people living in America, it's being written by people living in uh, England, it's being written by people living in Australia, and what they are expressing, and whether you're elitist here or not, in those countries you belong to the margins, you are a minority, you do not have a voice. And what they are doing is in the wider Anglophone world, they are giving Pakistan a voice, so that's one aspect. In our own uh, literature, it is another issue. The issue is what determines your creative language. I come from a family, my father spoke English mostly, my mother was entirely in Urdu. Uh, I have English writers in my family, I have Urdu language. The Urdu language writers tend to be belonging to an older generation. The younger ones, like, if you tell me to write in English, I'd never write anything, I'd never uh, write in Urdu, I just wouldn't get anywhere. That was my education. You told my mother, my mother wrote her first book, her memoir, uh, she was 84 when her first book was published. And um, she, uh, and the Urdu edition in her original language, because OUP didn't have an English program, an uh, Urdu program at the time, actually came out a week after she died. Now, if you had said to my mother that you please write in English because, you know, she would have said, hum se to nahi ho sakta, hum kaise kare, hum kaise. Although she spoke English, she would have gone into a complete flap. So what determines your language when you're saying that, you know, you should look at this, are you going to deny, the, if you say an English medium, and I do know this has happened to a friend of mine, a person brought up in the English medium, why are you teaching them English medium? Oh, that's another issue. Are you telling me that those people have no right to a voice? that they have no, that they must try and write in a language that they cannot express themselves, they might be able to read it. Now, I don't know about bilingual people and what determines their choice of language. You speak to someone like Haris Khaliq, he will tell you he writes in Punjabi, Urdu, and English. He will tell you that one language offers him certain freedoms or liberties or ways of expressing himself that it doesn't. So he, he does all three. Um, Amir Hussain has now started writing in English, Urdu. He knew Urdu, but he wouldn't write in it. And now he started writing Urdu stories and he translates them. And Osama has a strong Urdu background, which I find absolutely enviable. But so I think we need to move away from this sort of anti-English debate and accept that it's there. I don't think it dominates our literature. What it does, unfortunately, and this is a big issue again in academia, is about the domination of English in the world, and is it going to influence writers in other languages, because do they, do writers in other languages, then start writing books in languages that are on a subject that are easily translated into English or which appeal more to an Anglophone audience? Does that threaten? That is an issue you should look at. Does that threaten your local literature? Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree, and, you know, and it's not just an issue related to here. I know a wonderful um, Albanian writer who, in order to tell the stories of his land, for those to be shared, he had to write in Italian. Because if he wrote only in Albanian, which is his mother tongue, the language of his heart, he could not share what was in his heart with an audience beyond those who already understood him. And his mission, I think, which are a little bit like those of all writers, is to get people to walk into our worlds, to share that world with them, to walk around, to say, yes, this is what it is like to be me to hear what I hear, to say what I say. And quite often I wonder, you know, and I've been asked, why do I write stories of first and second generation immigrants? Why do I write stories if, of countries where I no longer live? Why do I write stories of France, of Pakistan, and so on? And I think it is because, yes, there are other people much better qualified to write stories of those places, but I write stories of, of people. I write stories about what is under the skin. 
And if I can't share that, then I will never let people walk in my world. I will never be able, if someone like me does not put the stories of contemporary Pakistan and Bangladesh into the Western literary canon, I'm unsure who will. So that is why I always have protagonists who are like me or who are like my children, who are like people I know. And that is why I think, yes, perhaps there are others who are better qualified to tell the story of that place, but perhaps I am best qualified to write the story of that person. And so I kind of, you take your hit and you know that sometimes you're perhaps not writing with the same clarity and heart of a particular place, but you, you, know, you can only write with, I guess, your, your own heart or you can only write as clearly as you can. And I think that's, that's what we all do as writers. So I complete, it's not spoiling the party, I, it's a point that's completely understood. And I think that we are none of us perfect in what we try and write about, but I think we, what we just want to do is share our stories and to try and get that out into the wider world. I quite often tell my students in Oxford that they are the ones that, you know, if those who are writing English as a first or a second language are extraordinarily privileged because it means that because they've written in English, their work can be shared in the same way that those who write are Italian or French, their work will be translated and shared. So it is um, great good fortune in some ways, but in another way, I understand what you were saying about something that must be lost. Can I collect two questions because we are running short of time? So we've got Akil that I saw first and then the lady in the front, please. Uh, so my question is that uh, it is often stated that uh, Lahore is a historic city, but uh, ironically, when we look at the novels in Urdu and Tamil as in English, uh, we could find that uh, there are two Lahores actually the old Lahore, the old city, and the cloning space. And the novels always deal with uh, what I have read about. Three or four novels uh, in English and Urdu, and then they all deal with the colonial space. I mean, the mall, the party house, and then the Lawrence Garden, and all this. And do you feel that uh, the Lahore, the interior, the old city, needs to be represented in fiction and the culture of Lahore, uh, like food culture and all other things? Great, thank you. And, and yourself? So, I want to go back to your discussion about <coughs> the definition of home. So, I also live a where home is going to be when you want to maybe retire. And I, I don't see too much literature coming out of that because, and I think it's a really important subject because the evidence that is related to actually the feeling you don't really know what, you, what place you want to call home and where you would like to put down your final roots is a very real reason <coughs> of all the that's really interesting. And um, one of the stories in Keita Sharaz's latest collection deals with that exact topic of, yeah, it, uh, so I'll give you that reference. I'd have to look up the name. Um, but quick responses then to these two questions. One about the old city versus the more colonial spaces in fiction, and one about home and particularly this experience of maybe ageing and wanting to return home for retirement. So this is a marketing pitch. <laughs> You'll find it, you'll find the colonial city and the old city. I, I think, um, as I said, there's a lot which needs to be written. I myself, you know, my grandmother, my grandfather were sort of uh, allotted a house in the old city, Nanarkali, uh, when people came across the border and through the evacuee property system and all that. So I have tremendous sort of childhood memories of these five story houses, which are quite unique. And there's an entire life which is on the roofs, right? So the, uh, you know, people store their stuff, there's kite flying, there are pigeons, there are people meeting on the romances, romances exactly, <laughs> and there are people who are killjoys, you know, lurking in the corners. Uh, so there are all these characters there, and there's life down below in the streets, you know, so the dimensions are quite interesting. So I quite agree, and, and, and much as you, I don't know how other people set out to write a book, I can only comment on my own, and I think it's a complex combination of politics, aesthetics, what you want to capture, what you want to communicate. And, but part of the motivation was to capture the old city, to capture this unique experience. And I guess I also read Mahfouz and you know how he had captured Cairo and other writers, uh, Pamuk was sort of mentioned. But you know, everyone has their own story to tell. So my characters, as I said in, in this novel, uh, in the contemporary period, 
populate all these areas, or at least they, they come in, or they go out, or they actually live there. Um, but then I go back, and I also try and imagine the same space in a different century, so the mid-17th century, because I'm fascinated by Jahangir and I think another uh, great historical figure who's not completely understood. And um, So I think, you know, so it's interesting how then I try and imagine if there are people coming from the rural areas to Lahore, how does it seem to them? Uh, and then the colonial period is important, it's part of it, and there are parts of our history which are just completely not covered. So I actually excavated something which was recently uh, discovered and has a connection with the Miami, what used to be the Miami cantonment. So an entire infantry, uh, Bengal infantry, rebelled here from here because the title also spoke about mm -hmm. rebellions. And, so there's a history of rebellion which goes back. And then there is the Miami graveyard. You know, it's an almost a thousand year old graveyard. It's a fascinating space. And if you just take a walk and look at the tombstones, there are stories there. So yeah, I mean, there are millions of stories which need to be told. And, and, but I guess um, you can't force it on people. Writers have to emerge organically. And that is my answer to your thing as well. I think the, the, this experience is being written about, but I guess it remains to be seen as to what future writers choose, because I truly believe it has to come from within. Well, I mean, obviously, because it is, um, it, we're talking about, to a large extent, part English language writing. Um, there's a lot more that needs to be written, in, in, and Osama has uh, tackled this wide spectrum, of, and and you and you do get it in in other, but it has it needs. Uh, what I want to go, talk about is this uh, complex of home. I've actually done an anthology. But I did it about um, in 2001. It's called Leaving Home, and it's it it looks at different forms of migration at partition, urban to rural, tribal to urban, you know, all these, and then it's got one section, and then you leave home, and then there is a section on returning home. And how you, it's, it's a very personal thing, and people do write about it, but how do you negotiate this space? And actually, when you go away for many years, and you return to what was home, it's all changed. So how do you adjust to that? So in a way, you are, um, Kresra Shiraz has actually done a story on that. Um, about a man who was so unhappy in England, and he just wanted to go home, he just wanted to come, I think it was to Lahore. Yes. Yes. And, and he, then he comes back again. And then he comes, <laughs> and he, it's completely strange, and he goes back to England, he says, oh God, this is home. So, um, how do you negotiate it? I don't know, but it is always different. When you go away for many years, I've met young people who come to Pakistan and say, okay, but this is not the Pakistan our parents told us about. They're being, they're being uh, you know, emulating manners, ways of dress. Um, the girls in Pakistan don't do this, you don't do that. And they find it's all happening, you know, it's a much freer society to what their parents left. So it is a complex situation and a very interesting topic, actually, for fiction. Yeah, um, like Islam, I think I can probably answer both questions with the same response. Um, because I, I write kind of sprawling, big novels. Um, my last one weighed in at 170,000 words. and. 600 pages, and it means that I can, I have a broad canvas, so it means I can kind of travel a lot between these spaces. And so my novels tend to kind of start, you know, pre-partition, probably from the 40s, and I bring, and because I have this broad canvas, I can bring them straight up to, you know, where we are in the contemporary space. So I tend actually, in, when I'm talking about Lahore in my books, when I'm talking about Pakistan, I probably start off with the more colonial space, and then as I move forward in decades and generations, I start to approach the more contemporary spaces. So I feel there is a balance. There is a sense of a kind of, of a memory and um, something that is, I guess, claimed or pushed away with the sense of the colonial. There is an understanding of where it came from, but then there is a sense of what we are doing now and how the city is now. And in terms of the sense of you know, where do you go back to? Where is this place? Um, in my last book, I actually did do cover that, actually, because one of the, um, the people who was pushed away to study in the 50s and becomes one of the GPs in um, Britain, the, um, the doctors of 62, who everyone comes in to prop up the NHS service, he comes back when his mother's ill. He comes back every few years. And in some ways, it, he finds that kind of quite complicated, not in terms of him wanting to come back and help, because he says, what am I doing? It's a desk job in in London, I'm looking after coughs and sneezes and city diseases and I'm not doing anything helpful. I'm not doing anything that someone else couldn't do. Whereas back in Pakistan, he feels useful. He feels that this is where he can do most good. 
and eventually that is where he wants to come back. But funnily enough, the family that pushed him away to study to go and be extraordinary and absent, they don't want him back being present and correct. They would rather that he stayed away and be this great story they could tell than come back and be someone who actually, when he sees himself, is probably surprised at quite how small and insignificant he seems in the mirror. He isn't this sort of great, clever person who got educated abroad and became a doctor and did something amazing. He's just a small, simple man trying to do his best in his hometown. And for some reason, he realizes that actually creates a dissatisfaction among those who believe they were doing something better when they sent him away. So in some ways, for him, coming back is a triumph, emotionally. For those around him, it feels like a failure. That's a great place on which to end. Thank I want to thank all three speakers and thank you for some really interesting questions. Thank you.